about y'all, but I'm so glad that 2021 is ending. Hello and welcome to What a Ghoul Wants. My name is Anna, I am your ghoul, and what I want is to talk about Bloody New Year. Now, I know this past year has been really hard for a lot of people with COVID having really no real end in sight. I'm hoping that 2022 will bring an end to it and will kind of get back to some sort of normal, but I honestly can't say that my hopes are super high. I don't want to start on a depressing note, but I know New Year's are a time for resetting and refocusing, and I do hope that in the new year I can really focus on my content and bring you all some good content about horror films and just keep doing what I'm doing, but I know that it's been tough and I hope that everybody is doing okay despite everything that's going on. But I am excited for the new year and hopefully it will bring some good changes and maybe some new positivity, we'll see. So I wanted to do a movie review and I know it's been a while since I did just a straightforward movie review of one movie and I thought this was the perfect time to do a review for a New Year's themed movie. And I'd actually never seen Bloody New Year before. I watched it specifically for this review. I was torn between this and New Year's Evil. I think that's the most well-known New Year's themed horror movie. But I decided to go with Bloody New Year because it's a little less well known and a little less talked about. So I figured why not um, watch it and give you guys my thoughts on it. So yeah, let's just dive on into the review. Bloody New Year was released in 1987. It's a British horror film and it's directed by Norman J. Warren. It's a low budget supernatural slasher, which there were a lot of those being released in the late 80s. And I don't know if it was kind of kicked off by the Nightmare on Elm Street series, but it seems like in the later part of the 80s, there were a lot of supernatural slashers coming out. and. Bloody New Year has a lot of things in common with another supernatural slasher that was released in 1987. And it's a film that a lot of horror fans probably have seen, and that's Hello Mary Lou Prom Night 2. So there's a lot of nostalgia in the 80s for the 50s and 60s. It's kind of like how right now we're getting a lot of 80s and 90s nostalgia because the people that grew up in that era are now being able to make art and reflect on that era. So we have a lot of movies in the 80s that reflect back on the 50s and 60s. And that's exactly what Bloody New Year does. Although I did read that uh, the reason it's set in the present as opposed to all in the 50s was due to budgetary constraints. So we do get a little bit of the 50s flavor, but we also get the 80s as well. And we start out the film in the 50s. It's actually New Year's Eve from 1959 into 1960. And there's a party happening. We see some party goers having fun and then eventually leaving. So everything is all decorated for Christmas and New Year's. It's a very nice holiday feel. And then this girl goes to check her makeup in the mirror before she goes and gets sucked into the mirror by a hand. Ah! And we don't know what that's about, but it's, it's very quick. It happens super fast. And then we just flash forward to quote unquote present day or the 80s. So we're not exactly sure what that's all about at the beginning, but um, we get a group of British teens having fun on the beach. Uh, they end up going to this fun fair where they get into some trouble with, I don't know if they're bikers or carnies or what you would call them, um, or punks even. Uh, but yeah, these kind of gnarly looking guys are threatening them and so forth. And they end up saving an American girl from them on this ride. She is being tormented by these guys. They won't let her get off this ride. So our gang of British kids helps her out, gets her away. And this is the core group of six kids that we will follow through the rest of the film. Also at the fun fair, the girls are talking to a fortune teller who kind of, sort of, lets them know that something bad is gonna happen, but not really. When you stand beside the river, you only see a very small part of it. But if you go to a great height, then you can see more of the river. And the guys rush in and they knock over her crystal ball, which starts bleeding. And you're like, whoa, what is this about? Is this the bloody in the bloody new year? It's gonna uh, predict what's gonna happen later in the film. 
Turns out that's not quite true, I guess. I don't really know how it comes back into play. And that's just a little indication of how the movie is going to be a little confusing. Uh, things don't really make sense. You kind of just go along for the ride and see what happens. Uh, there are a lot of plot holes or things that just don't add up or it's not quite clear what's going on. And I think that the writers and the director wanted that to be a part of the supernatural element, but it kind of just comes across as a little hard to follow and a little confused. Also the fact that Carol, I believe her name is, she's the American in the group. Um, she just meets these people. It's her first time ever meeting them at the fun fair. And she just decides to go on this boat ride with them, uh, it, with this group of complete strangers, which, yeah, I know that they saved her earlier and they're like her age or whatever. But the fact that she goes on this boat with all of these strangers is very odd to me. And I don't really know why they added that in. Like, I don't know why. Maybe they could only get an American actress. And to explain why she's American and not British, they have to introduce the fact that she just got into town and her friends haven't arrived yet, which is why she's going to hang out with these brand new people. That part does not really make sense to me, but hey, we just got to roll with it. But regardless, they get away from the bikers or carnies or whatever. They go ahead and take a boat ride and end up on an island where they find this old hotel. So the hotel they find is the Grand Island Hotel. It's very strange because it seems like no one else is around and everything in the hotel is set like it was in the beginning shots of the movie. What's going on? It's only July. A Merry Christmas. <laughs> and a Happy New Year to you. <laughs> yes. So all of the Christmas decor and the New Year's decor is still up. So it's very fishy. And as far as a setting for a horror movie, it's pretty cool. Um, just any kind of isolation where uh, characters are on an island where help is far away, especially because uh, they get stranded because their boat hits rocks and takes on water, so they have no way of getting back. That always adds kind of an interesting element into the mix. So when they get to this hotel, they split up, which, as we all know, is a big horror no-no. Let's split up. Do we have to? And one of our characters, Leslie, sees a face in the window. So we're all wondering, who is that? Who else is on this island? What's going on? But there seems to be no one inside the hotel itself. And indications that something supernatural is happening. There are some very goofy things. We see a shot uh, lingering on a magazine, and it just closes by itself. Right. And we go, ooh, oh no, spooky ghosts maybe? We're not sure. <laughs> so there's a lot of effects in this movie that I appreciate. They only had, you know, so much money to do these effects. And while they may not be the most impressive or executed the best, um, you can definitely tell what the makers of the movie were going for. And finally, we see a ghosty maid appear in the hotel. So now we know that there are supernatural beings that are interacting with the kids. So that's an interesting thing. We don't know how it's going to go from there. The maid herself does not seem scary or malicious in any way, but we know there's something going on. There's also another <laughs> really silly effect where one of the characters is taking a bath and the little shower nozzle just like moves slightly and we're like, oh no, what's gonna happen? And then we get a jump scare. <laughs> oh, so we've got some pretty uh, cliche horror movie things that are happening in this movie. So they're all soaking wet from their boat taking on water and them having to swim in the ocean to get to shore. So they end up changing into clothes that are in the hotel and they just happen to be 50s clothes. So they're putting on what we think are the ghost's clothes. Um, we're not sure at this point, but we know it's probably not a good idea for them to be wearing these outfits. And that's reinforced by a ghostly woman in a mirror looking at the girl who just put on her exact same dress. So we get a little menacing there. Honestly, a lot of scenes in this movie really reminded me of what Kubrick did very well with The Shining, which is having ghosts of the past interacting with the current people. And obviously, this movie does not carry it off nearly as well as Stanley Kubrick does in The Shining. But I wonder if they took some inspiration from that, especially because it's in this isolated hotel which is the same premise as The Shining. There's also a line where someone literally says, you look like you've seen a ghost. You look as if you've seen a ghost. 
exist, which, oh my gosh, the, even in the 80s, I feel like that was probably already cliche, but I don't know, maybe it wasn't nearly as cliched as it is now to say that in a movie. Um, so I just thought that that was funny that someone actually said that. I also love the fact that um, British people call a pool table a snooker table. I wonder what it's like doing it on a snooker table. I feel like I heard that at one point before, but um, I was reminded of that fact while watching this movie. And I just think it's so funny, but they probably think it's weird that we call it billiards. So if you are from the UK, and uh, you think it's weird that we call pool billiards or, or pool, comment down below, because I always think it's funny when there are little words like that, nicknames for things that are different in different countries, so I had to comment on that. And the billiards table is important because we see the classic reverse shot of film where the billiards are apart and then they reverse and come together. There are a lot of shots like that in this movie where the film is just reversed to make it look like things are being put back together or undone. So that's another thing where I, it can be cool if done right. In this movie, it's just a little bit silly and cheesy looking to me. And we get a really silly uh, killer vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Uh, the power at the hotel is out and when one of the characters gets the power going again, everything starts up and it kind of looks like ghosts are controlling things and it's really not scary at all. But again, they're just trying to inject the question of, is this place haunted? Is it not? What's going on? We also get a direct shot of a television. Um, it's like a 50s television playing a 50s program and it's just the most obvious way to try to explain what's happening. It seems very premature too, like it's something we could probably hold off on telling the audience and I guess it's like, oh, the audience is gonna know what's happening um, while the characters don't so you can kind of feel tense for them because you know what's going on. You're like, oh, these characters need to find out and figure out what's happening. But it just becomes very trite. Uh, it's just like, oh, okay, here's the explanation. There's this 50s scientist saying that an experiment has gone wrong or um, something's happening with a plane. And it's really not clear. Of course, it's not real science, but I actually wrote this down because I was trying to figure out exactly what they were trying to go for. And it still doesn't really make sense, but. <laughs> So the scientist says that it's an experimental anti-radar device launched at the opening hours of 1960, um, and it's interfering with light and time itself somehow, and there's a plane involved. Bending light, making the plane invisible. It, it, it's interfering with light, with, with time itself, playing God. Very, very dangerous. Very unclear, but we know that it's something to do with what's happening at this hotel, and it's affected the people that we see at the beginning in the 50s. So still, like, you're giving us all this information, but it's also still unclear. I don't know. It's kind of confusing for me. So the kids are kind of left up to their own devices. They're in their 50s garb, just running around this hotel, you know, getting into stuff that you would if you found an abandoned hotel. And they end up in this theater room where there's a projector and uh, they put a movie on and we see some old footage. And someone on the film actually jumps out of the projector screen and attacks one of the guys. <laughs> And that effect is pretty cool, actually. Um, it kind of comes out of nowhere. You're not expecting it. And I do think that it comes off well. But with a lot of the effects in this movie, they're kind of just done for surprise or shock value. And then they're almost immediately, like, gone. <laughs> so that happens a couple more times in the film as well. But still, it was a pretty cool shot. Another gripe that I have with this movie is that it's called Bloody New Year. And there's really not much blood in it at all. Pretty minimal gore. And the gore that is there is not very good. I think that the makeup artist tried, but I don't know if they just didn't have the materials or what. I, I just don't think that it looks very good personally. So two of the characters go to this little, um, I don't know, it's an outdoor building, uh, if it's like the groundskeeper's building or something like that, but one of the girls gets attacked by a rope and that scene goes on for way too long. <laughs> Ah! 
and her reaction is just, like, way over the top. Like, yeah, weird stuff has been happening, and I get that you're freaked out, but she just really overacts in that moment. And the rope itself is just not very scary or impressive. It just kind of lays on her, and you're like, can't you just get it off of you? Like, what's going on? And then we get this random seaweed creature popping out of, like, a table or something and attacking them. Who are you? I'm all Greg. Pleased to meet you. And that part's also confusing. I just don't know how, like, the physics of the world works. Like, things just seem to appear out of nowhere. Like, the uh, guy in the projector kind of makes sense because he's already a person and you see him on the screen. But the seaweed man literally just comes out of nowhere and then disappears into nothing again. So the rules of this world just don't make sense. There's not much consistency. So that part was also a little confusing and a little jarring to me. Again, you just kind of have to roll with it with this movie. Things are just going to happen and you kind of have to just be like, all right, okay, sure, why not? (laughs) And we get a lot of weird cuts again, um, like at the beginning when the girl was pulled into the mirror and that was cut very short. In this instance, we see the guy is, I guess, getting stabbed in the back or something is happening where he gets hurt, but it cuts immediately after that. (laughs) Uh, If you blink in this movie, you will miss things because things just happen very abruptly and very quickly, and then it just changes completely over to a different scene. So you might have to rewind a couple times to really catch what's happening. I definitely had to do that while watching this movie. Also, there are music cues for everything. Like anytime something scary is going to happen or, you know, a jump scare, there's a music cue for it. And I just really hate when movies do that because it takes out all of the suspense. You know that something's going to happen and you're expecting something to happen. So when there's a cue every single time something scary happens, it just really takes me out of it. And it really bores me, which is unfortunate. And we also just spend a lot of time when the characters are outside uh, having still shots on just moving grass or trees. And that seems like it was to pad the runtime a little bit. It also does not really add suspense for me. It's just like, okay, boring shots of greenery. Just really takes up a lot of time in the movie, and they could have definitely cut that out, but I think they may not have had a full movie runtime if they did that, so I guess maybe they just had to pad it. I don't know. Another pretty bad effect is the ghost footprints in the sand. The score that happens when we see those two is really goofy. Oh, wow, that's not scary at all. If anything, I laughed at it and I thought it was funny. So again, I know low budget, they were trying their best with what they had. But to me, in 2021, uh, 2022, actually, uh, it just seems really goofy. And then we get an explosion. And that's pretty cool, actually. And we also get a ghost pilot. Uh, So that kind of ties in with what we see on the TV earlier in the film, the plane that we saw, so we can gather that the pilot has something to do with the experiment that went wrong. So that is a cool tie-in, and I really think that they could have done more with the pilot character. He's kind of just there as a little jump scare now and then. He doesn't say anything, which I thought it would be cool if he had a dialogue with the characters but we just don't get that, so. It's kind of just like there are little vignettes of supernatural type things happening, and they don't necessarily, like, make sense in one movie. It's just kind of, like, random. It doesn't necessarily seem like things are tied together. Like, we get this shot of Carol in the hotel. She's opening doors, and there's blizzards happening. Like, a bunch of snow comes in through the door, and she gets, like, attacked by the snow. And then we see, like... There's a little replica of her in a snow globe. And it just doesn't make any sense. Like, it's a cool concept, but in relation to the film as a whole, it doesn't make any sense. (laughs) So they had some good ideas in this movie. It was just the execution and the way they were all tied together just really didn't work for me. So we see that the biker carny guys have made it to the island somehow. We don't really know how. And they're still after this group of kids for some reason. They really have a vendetta against these kids. And so they are attacking them in the hotel. 
At one point, one of them literally, like, shoves their head through the wall and has this, like, weird, I don't know if it's a machete knife thing. It's just so random. Like, it seems like the walls in this place are made out of paper mache. Like, they're so easy to break. So that's really strange because you have them plus the ghosts that are there. And come to find out one of the girls, the girl who was attacked by the net, I think her name was Leslie. She turns out to be a zombie ghost thing. And this is where it really reminded me of Hello Mary Lou Prom Night 2 because her makeup looks really similar to where Mary Lou has the uh, scars and stuff on her face from the burns. This looks kind of like that. You get kind of half of her regular face and half is all gross but it doesn't look nearly as good as Hello Mary Lou. So that's another weird connection parallel thing. I don't know when they actually came out, if they would have had any idea about the other film or if it just happened to be a coincidence that they looked so similar, but I just thought that was interesting. Again, if you haven't seen Hello Mary Lou Prom Night 2, I highly suggest it. It's so good. It's so campy and I personally really like it a lot and I definitely prefer it to this movie for sure. So one of the guys in the group uh, fights back against zombie Leslie, and this part was so abrupt, he literally punches his fist through her body. It goes straight through her stomach. (laughs) Just clean. Um, So she's made of paper mache too, I guess. I don't know. Uh, That part made me laugh out loud. (laughs) And at one point, Janet, one of the girls, falls like into the ground. Like it's quicksand, but it's not. Uh, There's a lot of, like, people being half buried in the ground in this movie. (laughs) We get that a little later in the film as well. And then one of the bikers just flies through the window. I don't know how he got the speed or the velocity to be able to do that, but he does. And that's pretty interesting and uh, honestly kind of epic in the moment. Then the banister comes to life. It's this little weird duck-looking thing and grabs onto... Janet's arm, and it's just this amalgamation of weird supernatural things happening with no real reason. It's just kind of for shock value. Also, this part made me laugh out loud, too. One of the guys, Rick, shoots Leslie, the zombie girl, and when the bullet hits her, it literally makes, like, a farting noise. Leslie! And it's so funny and it's supposed to be scary or exciting, but it just ends up being really, really funny. And he also uh, ends up chopping off her arm, which it's pretty bad. You can clearly see her real arm is like tucked into her sweater while the fake arm is being chopped off. Uh, Just little things like that where it's like, I know, I know you guys didn't have a big budget, but I think you could have maybe tried a little bit harder to make these kinds of things more convincing, but this is what we got. <laughs> so the guy we thought maybe was dead or attacked in that outdoor area uh, comes back and he's very delirious. He doesn't know what's going on. And you're like, all right, what's his deal? And this part I thought was actually pretty well done. Um, He's laying down on, I think it's Janet's lap, and he's talking, you know, and his voice slowly gets deeper and sounds kind of demonic, like kind of exorcist-like. I always liked you the best. You were Rick's girl. Rick's the leader. So he gets the best girls. Oh, no. And I did like how they did that. And turns out he's one of those zombie ghost things, too, and he attacks Janet She runs into this elevator, and this is something that absolutely reminded me of A Nightmare on Elm Street, and she's in this elevator, she presses one of the buttons, which turns to goo, which looks really weird and gross, Um, but the wall behind her, you see stretches, and these two kind of hands come out, and it looks almost exactly like the shot in A Nightmare on Elm Street, where Freddy is putting his head and hands through the wall over Nancy's bed, and again, it's something that's done way better in A Nightmare on Elm Street. The execution in this one is a little weird. It doesn't really look like the wall. You can kind of see there's like paint over the uh, latex or whatever they use, and it's very clearly just someone like pressing into this material. That seemed like the most egregious ripoff to me uh, in the whole movie, but again, they tried. A lot of these late 80s movies just took a lot from the more successful 80s movies that came earlier in the decade. And then Janet is just sucked completely into the wall, and again, that looks meh. 
It looks fine. It looks okay. Not great. And then we get this kind of goofy sequence in the hotel kitchen where one of the biker guys just falls into this giant vat pot thing. I don't know what it is, if it's soup or whatever. Um, that's pretty goofy. And then there's like a little bit of blood that comes out of this spout thing. And it's just so funny because anytime there's blood in this movie, it's like the most minimal amount, even though it's called Bloody New Year. And we get another reverse shot of everything in the kitchen going back together. At this point, we're like, okay, we get it. This is getting kind of old. Also, Leslie's arm just reattaches to her body. And then we end up back in the ballroom area and we get an exposition ghost lady who tells us even more about what's going on, even though we had the stuff on the TV earlier. I guess that wasn't enough. They really just wanted to spell it out for us. An experiment. An experiment that went terribly wrong. The government made a plane on New Year's Eve. A plane carrying a device that would change the structure of time and matter. This device would shatter time itself. And the planet crash would Here. Here on Grand Island in the house, in time forever. Dead. Or alive. We are all caught in this awful, angry half world. And we can't escape. Ever. Ever. And she says that they can't escape ever, ever, ever. We get even more stuff moving around, uh, ghosty things happening. And this last sequence where uh, they ride out on the pool table feels like it takes forever. So finally, two of the kids, Rick and Carol, escape and they get to the boat that the bikers use to get to the island, I guess. But Rick thinks that he sees his girlfriend, Janet, who we know she's a ghost. We know she's not real. Um, she's calling to him and he ends up running after her and getting sucked down into the sand where a zombie ghost biker guy has this weed whacker and Rick's head sticking out of the sand. We know what's going to happen. He takes it. He gets so close to his head. <laughs> Of course, they cut away and don't show that kill, even though that probably would have been the coolest kill in the whole movie. So I was really bummed about that. And then Carol basically falls through the boat and we flash and we see all of the 50s people are partying once again in the hotel, including the gang of kids. They are going to be stuck there forever, I guess. Doomed to repeat New Year's or get anyone who comes on the island to die and join their weird afterlife party. So yeah, overall, I just think that this movie is a really silly late 80s supernatural slasher that kind of borrows things from other movies in the genre and doesn't quite say much new stuff. I mean, the premise is pretty interesting. It's just the execution is not very good. Um, the actors are okay. Uh, some of them are overacting. Their performances aren't super memorable either way. Some of the effects are all right, some are pretty bad. Yeah, it definitely had some cool elements, but it's just kind of a really mixed bag when it comes to the overall execution of the film. So I would say if you have a burning desire to watch it, go ahead and see it. Again, I haven't seen New Year's Evil, so I don't know how it compares to that movie. I definitely would like to watch that because it is one that pretty much everyone talks about on New Year's, so I will see that in... See if I like it better than Bloody New Year, but overall, um, Bloody New Year was neither that bloody nor really set on New Year's. The kids find the hotel on summer break, so it's like July, and you don't get much New Year's imagery other than, you know, at the very beginning and I guess while they're at the hotel, but not really. It's mostly Christmas stuff. So if you're looking for a movie that has like a New Year's feel to it, eh, this one really isn't it, uh, at least for me. So I will watch New Year's Evil and see if that has more of like a holiday horror feel to it. Because that's what I really look for when I seek out slashers of this kind. I really want to get a sense of the holiday that it's happening on. And Bloody New Year just didn't really do it for me. I give it two stars because I do admire the ambition and there were some things in it that did go well for me, but overall it's pretty below average and I'd say you can probably skip this one unless you really want to see it for some reason. So that is my review for Bloody New Year. There is one more thing I just wanted to tack this on at the end because I wanted to tell you all about it. So for Christmas, I got a new horror book and that is 1000 Women in Horror 1895 to 2018. And it's by Alexandra Heller Nicholas. 
And I've had my eye on this book for a while. I'm so happy to finally own it. I know that Alexandra Heller Nicholas is a pretty prominent horror writer, and I haven't read any of her other writings. I would love to get more of her books, but I am very glad that I own this one, and I can't wait to dig into it and read about the people that I love and discover new women in horror that I don't know about yet. So I will definitely let you guys know how I like it. I will probably be posting about it on my Instagram, so if you want to follow me on Instagram, I have that linked below, as well as my letterbox and any other social media that I'm on, so please feel free to follow me there. And if you liked this review, please like this video and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Your all support means the world to me. Thank you so much for watching. I hope everybody has a very happy new year. I can't wait to see what content I'm able to make in 2022. Thank you so much for watching and we'll talk horror next time. Bye.